as much as I knew the path to, to coming back home, it wasn't clear as to how perfectly laid out it was going to be. I was like, I wish people could tell me what it really is like here. But then when you hear, even though Ghana has changed from what it was, it's still, I feel complete. So I don't know what it is, I think it's a country. Then I started to grow and understand that no, this is a different way of everywhere you go is different, culture-wise, so you need to learn how to adjust, and I had to learn. You know, and sometimes when, when you hear their stories, you're like, I could have told them that wouldn't work. Those are the voices of returnees from the diaspora. Returnees to where, you may ask? Returnees to a country which is set to be Africa's fastest growing economy in 2018. Fancy leaving the diaspora, want to return or relocate? This country's beauty alone could have you signed up immediately. Republic of Ghana, a country with a population of around 28 million. It has a stunning Atlantic coastline found along the Gulf of Guinea, showing borders with Togo, Côte d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso. Often referred to as the Island of Peace, it's considered one of the most stable countries in West Africa. So we've just arrived at Kutika Airport. It's not as manic as I expected it to be. Um, but by God, isn't it great to be on Ghanaian soil? I'm going to go and look for a taxi. My reason for being in Ghana is yes, to visit family and friends. But two years ago, I'd done a documentary entitled Ghanaian Migration, A UK Perspective. And in this documentary, I explored Ghanaians who had left Ghana for a life in Britain. But now that I'm in Ghana, I cannot help but to investigate the reverse. Understand the need and what you bring, the brain gain, to this business. What your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. This J.F. Kennedy quote was one of the closing remarks heard at the Ghana Homecoming Summit in the summer of 2017. With a country that has so much to offer, who are the Ghanaians that are doing what they can for their country? What we require more than anything else is those that have had the experience in some of these industries that we have not had in this country to make sure we succeed. All the politicians and government officials can use encouraging, inspiring words to speak to you and I about returning home. But there really is nothing like hearing the experiences from those who have actually made that leap. Tomorrow, my quest begins to hear from those individuals who will not only share some light on what their lives were like in the countries they have left, but more importantly, what their lives have become now having returned home to beloved Ghana. I'm at Ghana International School in Cantonment and I'm here to speak with Dr. Mary Ashron. Dr. Mary Ashon is the principal of this school which ranks one of the best in Africa. Established in 1955, provides education from 3 to 17 years and has 1,410 students comprising of 58 different nationalities. Although Dr. Ashon has lived in Britain and the States, she is best described as a Canadian Ghanaian. I was born in Ghana. I um, grew up here until I was about six years old. And then my family moved to England for a couple of years, got back when I was about nine, ten, um, and then stayed here for the bulk of um, my teenage years and then moved back to the UK when I was 18 years old. I did my first degree in the UK and then moved to Buffalo, New York to do my graduate work. 
and then from there I moved to Canada. So I was in um, New York for five years and then um, in Canada for over 20 years before moving back to Ghana. In the States, I never thought I'd stay there. You know, so it was always, I'm just here to study and I'm going to leave and, you know, but where am I going to leave to? And I got married just after my first degree in England. So my husband and I moved to New York. So I can quite remember when I was just about to finish, um, we took out a, a map. And uh, I've always thought back and, and thought how beautiful that concept is that we actually took out a map to ask ourselves where we would like to live. And the world had become so open that you could actually consider that and say, okay, so if I want to live here, this is what I have to do, and you know. And we didn't want to go back to England. Ghana was in no fit state to return to. Uh, we didn't want to live in America. And my husband, um, he's a, he was a marine engineer and had traveled around quite a bit. And he said, you know, Canada's really nice. Every time the ship docked there, it was lovely. The weather wasn't too bad. Of course, that was British Columbia. He didn't tell me what Ontario was like. Um, and so we say, yeah, yeah, let's try Canada. And, and that's how we ended up in Canada because it was a cross between England, um, you know, and America. And uh, we ended up in Ontario where there were quite a number of Ghanaians and we found a community there. Uh, but we were also um, quite determined not to become the kind of immigrant who stays within the immigrant quarters all the time, you know, and make sure that we are well integrated, that we become Canadian as well without losing our Ghanaian-ness. So you decided to move back to Ghana when? Gosh, as soon as I got out. <laughs> it's, a, it's the oddest thing about Ghana, and I, I've heard it said about Egypt as well, that you know, once you drink the water from the Nile, you'll always return. Um, I don't know what I could compare to the Nile in Ghana, but I think that uh, when I decided to become a teacher, and I, I, I really got into it. I realized this was my passion. I became consumed with coming back home to, to give something back for, for want of a better cliche. Um, but my, my graduate work was in biochemistry. I was en route to becoming a research scientist and uh, finished my degree, moved up to Canada. There was a recession. There were no jobs in research. And I was just driving by a school and um, just thought, oh, this is neat. It was a, it said uh, Queensway Christian College. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, what's a Christian school? You know, because in Ghana, we didn't have to say this is a Christian school. People prayed anyway, you know, an assembly began and ended with prayer. Mm -hmm. So I got in there and I asked them, you know, what do you do? What kind of a school is this? And they explained to me that it was a regular school, but they just made sure that their principles were grounded uh, in the Bible. I thought, oh, that's really neat. Do you need a chemistry teacher? <laughs> and they said, not right now, but if you want to drop off your resume, you know when you're looking for a job, you have your CVs in the car, you never know who you're going to meet. Exactly. So I just gave them my CV, and the following week they called me. The chemistry teacher had quit. Wow. And that's how I got into teaching. So I taught for about three years. Mm -hmm. I thought, this is what I want to be doing the rest of my life. And so I quit for a year and went to Teachers College at the University of Toronto and did my Bachelor of Education there and then became a bona fide, you know, teacher. So once I, I got into it and I started making links in international education, I started thinking back to my own education and wondering what could we have done differently, you know, because I could look at myself and say, oh, you're successful, you have reached the pinnacle and so on, but could I have enjoyed my education better? Could I have been exposed to more things? Um, even though I, I think I've accomplished this or that, could I have done more? Mm -hmm. And it all could have started much earlier. You went to a very good uh, school in Ghana. So you went to Hachimoto, is that right? And it's supposed to the education system there, compared to, let's look at education across the board in Ghana, is, is very different. Now that you're back in Ghana, obviously you're the principal of a very established international school. How do you see education in Ghana? For the average Ghanaian has to access mainstream mm. education. I think it's difficult. It's very difficult and at times it feels hopeless. Um, we've got the institutions there. Um, we've got some capacity as well. Um, I sense that what we are missing is adequate training, pre-service and in-service. Um, I always keep coming back to teachers as, as assets. Um, about 10 years ago, when I started looking at the deeper problem, 
what could possibly be done in education. And um, a lot of the research always points to teachers anyway. But it started me wondering, what about teachers? You know, And uh, my husband is an engineer, and he just lives and breathes machines. So we're always talking about stuff like that. And it struck me one day when he was talking about maintenance engineering and how to ensure that machines um, go through their life cycle, producing and being as effective as possible. And I thought about teachers as well and how we need to be able to do that. that if we know that a teacher's life cycle is, let's say, 25 years, over the, the course of 25 years, what can we do to make sure that their output is at its maximum? Um, and when you look at machines, and I'll, I'll narrow down to a car, um, if, you, if money was not an option, you're likely to go for a car that is well engineered. Many women might not care too much about that, myself included. I just want a Beetle, and it must be green, all right? But then again, a Beetle is a German engineered car, and at the heart of it, that's what I want. I really want something that is well engineered. So someone might say, I want a Mercedes Benz, and this is the reason why. We know that it is well engineered. We've used the, be the best possible parts for this particular car. It will go a long while before anything starts to show, like uh, wear and tear starts to show. So when you look at maintenance engineering, they've got um, uh, a decay, mm -hmm. decay maps, mm -hmm. all right, or decay graphs, and it just shows you the different kinds of decay graphs. And so when you look at uh, a machine to ensure that it does not decay like, like mm -hmm. that, um, you start by engineering it well, mm -hmm. all right, designing it well. So for teachers, where the design takes place is in pre-service education, all right? So this is before you actually get into a school, you're in teacher's college, you're being designed well. What goes into the design of a teacher? What do we want that teacher to look like? And then after we've designed that and we bring the teacher into the workforce, we're in service now, and once it's in service, how do we ensure that that teacher continues to be effective? So let's go back to your car. All right. I don't know how much into your car you are, mm -hmm. but uh, I think just by virtue of being married to an engineer, I've gotten more into my car. I would have been the kind who would drive until the gas just run out or, you know, something just broke down. But I've learned to listen to the sound of an engine. All right. And um, I've learned to, to feel how the brakes move. So I can tell when something's slightly off with the brakes. I won't understand fully what is happening, but I know it's off. Uh, I work with patterns as well. And so the more I drive, the more I realize this is the pattern. As soon as it sort of sways a little bit from the pattern, I know. So when it comes to school, that's the same thing that I want to do. I want to make sure that I'm listening to my teachers so that there's a certain pattern. As soon as there's an aberration of some sort, bam, I know something's not quite right, and I want to get in there and see what can be done. Uh, as well, I maintain a car needs oil changes every so often, every couple of miles. If you notice, they'll say 10,000 miles or three months. Why do they say that? Because you could be the kind who just, you know, you, you use your car in the evenings, all right, and then grab a taxi or go on the subway during the daytime. Someone too might be the kind who drives it all the time. So whichever one comes first. All right. So for a teacher, what are we looking at? You know, all the wear and tear and, and stuff like that that happens. We need to give, you know, a, an opportunity for oil changes to happen. Either when the teacher themselves says, I need some training on this particular thing. Or when you get feedback from students and parents and they're saying, you know, this person's this or that, then you say, oh, you know, this person needs extra, um, like a workshop in classroom management or how to design more creative lessons or whatever. So it's all really, uh, it, it's almost big brotherish because you're sort of looking from above and looking at how you can organize it. But if you look at it like that and then you make sure that you have reflective pieces thrown in, the teacher feels empowered because they are able to also say, I need this and I need it at this particular time. And then you're also able to jump in and support them. Teachers um, who are teaching our kids uh, in the public system were taught with that old system where it was just memorizing things and not necessarily trying to understand. 
which is why the designing of them has to be so important. You know, they need to be able to understand that this is the way forward and this really creates critical, you know, thinkers. Um, we also love control, you know, as a, as a country. We're afraid to open doors for people to express themselves. Um, even when you look at our cultural institutions and stuff, there's always a certain structure we want to maintain. And sometimes I fear we are afraid of children, you know, and, and what they can, the possibilities. They're the possibilities. We, we'd like to keep them bottled up for as long as possible um, before. Um, and so that's why the, the teachers always, the, the sage on the stage uh, in, in, this, uh, in this system. Um, having said that, I need, to, I need to also state that the national curriculum is a beautiful one. Um, I've looked at it and I thought, wow, this is great, really well written, well designed. Um, so the curriculum is great, delivery is not so great, um, and this is where the imbalance comes in because I have been to classrooms in the public system where I've had tears in my eyes and I'm like, I wish we had a million of you, you know, because You've, you actually get it, you know? And that kind of a teacher, it was a school that we were working with in um, a village in, uh, in the Eastern region. And they have nothing, absolutely no computers, no nothing, nothing that would make you think, you know, this school is on the up. And um, they were out at recess, so there was nobody in the, in the classroom. So I just walked in and um, they couldn't afford posters. When they studied something, she would get them to design a poster and they would put that up on the wall. Now, um, pedagogically, that's very strong. When you see your work displayed, you are proud of yourself, you're motivated to do better, all right? Um, and so here she was really killing two birds with one stone. You know, she was trying to beautify her classroom, provide an aesthetic environment, but she was also motivating, you know, and the, empowering the children. And then um, they were studying something. I can't quite remember what it was, but she had used, ah, they came back to the classroom and then they were doing some counting exercises. Um, typically in a classroom that was well endowed, you know, you would have counters, what we call counters, all shapes and forms and, and stuff. She had them walk out and go and pick stones. And that was beautiful. I thought to myself, you know, someone would look at this and say, you're wasting time. But for little bodies that need to be moving around, stepping out, just walking out, especially for boys, right, is that release from a constrained space. Learning um, happens in all shapes and forms, but we are constrained within our educational environment here to think that learning only happens in the classroom. And it happens when a child is sitting still and, and, and facing a chalkboard with somebody standing in front of them telling them stuff. Um, so we, th this is where the mind shift needs to happen and it can't happen easily when somebody is in service training. That's why you have to start pre-service. Um, so if we could get that mind shift going, yes. So I was bringing that around to the fact that it's not, a, it's not an entirely systemic problem because you have your individual teachers who are just doing amazing work, but they're like in silos. And um, the government has got a great curriculum there. Uh, but leadership to implement that curriculum and to reward those who do it well and, and all of that, probably I'm one of the luckiest ones, really, um, because I got into a job that was very similar to what I was doing before um, with a status in the country that afforded me certain benefits that wouldn't necessarily have come if I just packed up my bags and said, you know what, I'm coming to Ghana. Uh, probably for me, the difficulty was in me defining what kind of identity I wanted to have. So my difficulties didn't have to do with physical things or economic things. Um, it was in knowing that deep down I'm a Ghanaian, but I've been gone so long that I don't think like the typical Ghanaian, but I'm here to lead mostly Ghanaians. They will look at me, and even before I open my mouth, I look like a Ghanaian. Um, I can also speak like a Ghanaian. 
but then there'll be things that I'm doing that will seem un-Ghanaian to them. And so how do I navigate that? You know, so there was that, and I don't think I was prepared for it because every time we talk about moving back home, it's all about the economics of it all. Where will you live? If you've got kids who are going to school, where will they go to school? Um, your job, if you're setting up a business, all of that. It's more of the economic stuff and less of you, the person, you know, and how you'll adjust, who will you connect to and, and that sort of thing. Um, for me, having gone to school here, I had classmates who had moved down earlier. So I had a welcome brigade, and that was, that was really lovely. I, I consider that one of the, the key things that helped me to settle. Um, I know also that because I made a choice to come home, um, where um, if I didn't like it, I could go back. I had a job where I was coming from. It wasn't like I'd lost my job, let's run back home or whatever. So knowing that I've made this choice, but if I'm not happy, I can go back. There was also some release in that, some freedom, you know, in that. Um, it was difficult to be confronted by um, a lot of poverty. Um, difficult only in the sense that I had to, again, ask myself what I want to do about it, you know. And so for me, uh, when you look at the strategic plan, I, I just prepared for the school, the five-year strategic plan. It ends with our service to the community. So we want to create an excellent educational system within the school. We want to hire the best people. We want to have sound financial management, have beautiful buildings and a beautiful campus and all of that. But so what? After all of this, so what? And that's my, my question, you know. And so for me, it was that whatever I do in the school, I must create an environment that empowers both staff and students to get out and make a difference, all right? So they must feel us in the community, helping out, using our privilege, because I don't want to hide from my privilege. I gladly embrace my privilege. Uh, some people are afraid of that because it makes you look like you're, you've got an ego or whatever. No, I was blessed to have great parents who were educated. I went to the best schools. I've had it, but that means that I have to, you know, the phrase to whom much is given, much is expected. And this whole environment, the school is full of privilege. So we need to step out and do something. And so that move back to Ghana was again for me to pursue that of saying that I've been given much and so I'm gonna give and how do I give that away? But it's been very useful for me connecting with people like myself who have moved back Lots of people from the UK have moved back. Not as many from Canada. Yeah, not as many at all. In fact, I don't think I've met anyone from Canada <laughs> who has moved back. I must be the only crazy one. Um, but lots from the UK, quite a number from the US. And I've tried to get together with them. We talk a lot about it. We, we exchange ideas. I belong to a WhatsApp chat group. It's called Returning Ladies. And so, you know, anything to do with things that ladies want. Hey, there's a sale going on here. <laughs> you know, this person bakes gluten-free bread because that's what I need to eat. And, you know, all of that stuff, um, that's, that's keeping me going. I mean, for somebody who wants to be a teacher, you know, um, and, and, and you come and talk to me, I, I can tell you what's going on and how to position yourself and, and all of that. So you're right, I think what they have to do or what should be done is to get those of us who have moved back in the different fields, uh, form some sort of a consortium. And then we can mentor those who want to come back, whether young or old, um, into coming back. Because invariably you hear people who have moved and they've invested so much and it just goes belly up and then they are out of the country. you know. And sometimes when, when you hear their stories, you're like, I could have told them that wouldn't work. You know, I could have told them, no, don't do it like this, do it like that. They shouldn't get disappointed or depressed or whatever when things aren't going smooth. Things take a long time in Ghana, that's another thing. You just have to keep plugging away. You need to talk to people and then to find out how best to position yourself. 
you know, and um, and it will it will happen. I think that we're so open for business that the opportunities are just there. The enthusiasm that radiates from Dr. Ashan is infectious. Dr. Ashan went from being a science teacher in Canada to the principal of this top ranking school. I'm certain with her passion for education, this very scenario would have played out for her anywhere in the world she chose to live. The fact is though, Dr. Ashan chose Ghana, wanting to be that educational professional in her home country, which came from her pure desire to give back. A saying comes to mind here, we rise by lifting others. This should be the end of what has been an insightful few days. Fortunately, a senior civil servant who works in the office of the president has agreed to meet with me and to offer his views that surround the subject of Ghanaians returning home. Mr. Mampo, thank you for speaking with me. I'm happy to be here in Ghana, to be home. Before we speak about uh, Ghana's relationship with the diaspora, can you just tell me a little bit about the work that you do here in Ghana? I, um, I work for the government of Ghana. I'm a part of the Foreign Service. I have served in the United Kingdom. Recently, I was in the Republic of Benin. So basically, yes, I'm a civil servant, but I work within the Foreign Service of Ghana. Just last month, there was the Ghana Diaspora Homecoming Summit. I understand that you, you're interested in Ghanaians coming home, but you're also interested in the, the wider diaspora coming home to Ghana. You know, my understanding of the word diaspora is an embodiment of all black people in the world. So the diaspora to me is not necessarily limited to Ghanaians abroad, but black people in the world. If we are looking at the role that our brothers and sisters scattered all over the world can do in terms of helping develop Ghana and to a broader extent the continent, we need to look beyond just the capacity as well as the financial resources of Ghanaians who are living abroad. We need to tap into the abilities of non ghanaians provided that they trace their heritage back to the continent. I view it as um, an, an opportunity to tap into the abilities of black people. The black American community, for instance, has a strong purchasing power. If they develop any kind of interest in the continent, whether it's emotional or economic, they have a lot of money to invest, which will ultimately inure to the benefit of the nation, that is the country that is hosting them. I'm looking at the fact that if we are able to expand or amplify the definition of, our, of the diaspora, we are also looking at a larger context in terms of investment, in terms of human resource, in terms of manpower capacity, in terms of um, even ideas that will go towards the development of Africa. If one looks at even concerts, events that have taken place in Ghana. As far back as I think the 70s, you had black Americans like Malcolm X, Ike and Tina Turner, you know, coming to Ghana because of their emotional connection to the country and to the continent. The amplification of the diaspora, it's not something that is part of postmodernism. Mm -hmm. The idea has always been there. Sometimes Maybe there is a period of, um, I won't say stagnation, but a period of lukewarm attitude towards each other mm -hmm. by virtue of maybe certain experiences that some have had. As we go forward, we try to correct those experiences, we try to work on them, we try to improve upon them so that they will have more reasons to come and when they come, they will have a reason to go back. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that Ghanaians abroad are not enough or we don't have enough Ghanaians living abroad who can contribute their quota towards national development. But evidently, if you are able to reach out to the entire African or black community out there, I think we stand to gain more with that kind of definition of the diaspora than restricting it to just Ghanaians who have made their way to the new world, who are no longer living with us as natives of this country. So I asked this question a few years ago and I feel that the question is still relevant today. The question is that how much, how much of other people's cultures do we or should we embrace? I mean, I can make a personal comment, mostly personal. The world is such that it's a global village. 
So invariably, people will influence each other. Cultures will influence each other. Um, societies will have impacts on one another. What they call the butterfly effect. What happens in China can be felt all the way in the United States of America. Um, it's a normal occurrence. Nevertheless, um, even as we undergo this process of, of transformation through influence, there is always the need to retain an identity that is um, native to where you find yourself. It's always important to retain that kind of cultural identity that is pure and has not necessarily been affected, shaped, or framed by something external. At the end of the day, we all live in the same society, but we are still different individuals. We can all live in a global village where we are influencing each other, but the uniqueness of sovereign states in terms of cultural attributes, in terms of cultural identity, has to be preserved and respected. Otherwise, we run the risk of revisiting colonialism. You know, that kind of global uniformity or uniformity in, in the way we live is something that is actually politically incorrect. It's something that must be avoided. So as much as we are influencing each other, as much as we are imbibing from the West, and I hope that the West will also learn from us, there is a strong need for us to retain that which is essentially African. Because that is even going to be the basis for our development. You know, the, the, the definition of, the, of, Af of development in the African context has to be predicated on our values, on our belief systems, on our experiences, on our history. You know, that can be defined for us. It can be constructed for us. It's an experience that is unique to us. And that kind of um, peculiar identity has to be retained. It has to be expressed. It has to be projected. We project our cultural identity to the rest of the world and also let the, world of, the rest of the world see that we are also beautiful. That we have our version of Spider-Man, we have our version of Superman, we have our version of Manhattan. And when you come back home, or if you stay home, invariably you begin to experience the same life that you believe you can experience, you can experience abroad. And for me, going around Ghana, there's some beautiful sights. And I think we all have a responsibility to project that beauty. Mr. Manfield spoke about Ghana's history with Pan-Africanism, the intellectual movement which, especially in the 70s, witnessed a solidified relationship between Ghana and all people of African descent. The essence of that movement is what needs to be at the centre of the diaspora drive. A less targeted and more broader approach will see Ghana reap an unimaginable richness to not only the country's economy, but society as a whole. My visit has run its course. As my stay comes to an end with only a few hours to go, I see that little bit more of Ghana. As I make my way to another part of this beautiful country, she certainly has some breathtaking sights. An example of Ghana's beauty is Abu, a town situated in the southern part of Ikwapim in the eastern region of Ghana. Just go, go and have a look. These are the scenes that can be used to our advantage. The striking and picturesque parts of our country are our soft power. A lot can be done in terms of our country attracting significant numbers from the diaspora. Being strategic, consistent and implementing an expanded approach is key. The phrase build it and they will come springs to mind when thinking about the diaspora. Diasporans come with their expectations, formed ideas and lived experiences. Sometimes, naively, they feel that it should just work for them anywhere in the world and Ghana is no exception. Living in somewhere like Ghana, sometimes things may go wrong. As trivial as it may sound, suddenly that ever so reliable machine that washes your clothes stops working and what you're used to quickly becomes a distant option. Does the world just stop? Does your whole world just stop? Listening to all my interviewees, what I've learned is that you just get on with things. Embrace the unexpected. Be at ease with the fact that you are constantly being tested and the beauty that you're surrounded by slowly becomes part of you.
If you decide to return or relocate home, she'll certainly teach you to become a more resilient version of yourself and how to keep survival real close. To be more serious about attracting more Kwekus, Brian's, Comforts, Anita's and Dr. Ashon's, we will really need to think about how we present such stories to the diaspora who are in desperate need of tangible testimonies. The pathway to one's return undoubtedly may be tough, but ultimately the efforts will deliver rewards with limitless possibilities to anyone who refuses to quit. What we require more than anything else is those that have had the experience in some of these industries that we have not had in this country to make sure we succeed. I feel in my bones that Africa is changing, Ghana is changing in a way that I wanted to be part of. That we are also beautiful. That we have our version of Spider-Man, we have our version of Superman, we have our version of Manhattan. And when you come back home, or if you stay home, invariably you begin to experience the same life that you believe you can experience, you can experience abroad.